All right, thank you everybody for stopping by to my talk. This is uh, more of a higher level talk compared to the previous talk that Johan gave. Uh, this is basically um, an overview of an experience that I had with a client implementing a, a custom USB uh, device controller driver using Zephyr RTOS. So a little bit about myself first. Uh, I'm an embedded software consultant based out of New York City in the, in the USA. Uh, the design work that I've been doing, uh, I've been working professionally for about 15 years as an embedded software engineer. Uh, started my consulting company in 2019, so we're looking at about four and a half years now where I've been doing consulting work. Most of the design work that I've been involved in have run a num number of different verticals, including medical devices, scientific instruments, the agri which have ma mainly been in the agricultural space, of course, automotive, defense, and because of where I am geographically, a lot of consumer electronics for a, a lot of startups. Um, and of course, my expertise and experience more recently has been with RTOS-based systems, of course, including Zephyr. And for most of the time that I've been working professionally, a lot of it has been in the Meta Linux, uh, mainly using Yocto project-based BSPs to deliver uh, software solutions for a lot of my clients. And on the application side, I've been working mainly with QT-based applications, so essentially just running the entire gamut of the embedded software stack, right, from RTOS-based to Linux, uh, kernel-based space applications, and also now uh, a lot of user-based applications as well. Um, you can check out my social media, LinkedIn and, and Twitter. Uh, I hope to uh, get connection requests and follows from, from all of you. It'd be great to just connect with everybody and just have a conversation online. And I've also been recently getting involved in trainings and workshops. Uh, you can sign up for my newsletter, where in addition to getting a schedule of when these workshops and training courses occur, you can also just get insight into some of the things that I learned throughout the course of my uh, project work. And of course, you can reach out to me via email and check out my website. <clears throat> so for today, uh, we're, this is a, a simple agenda about what we're going to talk about. Um, first, we're gonna talk about the project, just look at the system architecture of what we're trying to do, or what we were trying to do, the problem statement, and then we're just gonna go over a really brief uh, USB primer. It's just meant to kind of level set of the conversation and understand what we're, what we're aiming to achieve. Then we're gonna talk about the initial approach that we went through in, in implementing this, this custom driver, uh, some of the challenges that, we've, challenges that we faced, how we debug those uh, issues initially, what steps we took, what tools we used, what the final resolution was, which in my opinion wasn't the greatest resolution, uh, but you know, we had to do what we had to do to get a solution out the door to a customer. Um, and then next step, right? If I were to redo this project, which I'm, I'm actually working on right now, again, like on my own time, what sorts of steps that I could have taken uh, to improve the final solution and what are actually the next steps that I'm working on? And then we can, we're going to conclude with questions. So just quickly going over the project and what it entailed. So the client came to me and said, oh, we have an Enclustra based, uh, it's a Xilinx, uh, based board uh, and cluster makes basically production ready so they're not development boards they're actually boards that you can place into final solutions uh, that are ready to, to to be delivered and they're production ready they had initially a uart console um, and so essentially it's a zinc based platform that has a hard arm core and they just have a uart console to it and ethernet essentially so they those were um, the main initial peripherals that they had on their system and this is a diagram of the system architecture. So we have on the bottom right uh, an ARM hard block. And so this originally had the implementation that they wanted in terms of all the peripherals on their uh, MCU-based solution on the FPGA. And their goal, their target really, they, they created a custom, uh, well not a custom, but they use an off-the-shelf RISC-V core. And they wanted to create an application around that for their own kind of project. Um, and they used uh, Xilinx IP to serve as the USB controller on, uh, for, for device side. And again, this is a hard block. And they had a UART controller as well. Again, Xilinx IP, another hard block that both of those essentially tied to the RISC-V core. And um, the ARM core was not only just used for debugging, but also the, the, the RISC-V core implementation, uh, but by, by, you, by just accessing the RISC-V memory, but it also had access to um, the memory registers and, and registers of, of the other hard block. So we could 
poke and peek at the different registers uh, on the USB controller and also on the UART controller just to see, hey, you know, what was the state as we started to implement and test out um, the implementation? What, what were the actual registers that the hardware reported for debugging purposes? Um, so like I said, the existing system, it was based on an Enclustra based uh, Xilinx uh, FPGA board. Um, it had a hard ARM core, um, it had a UART console, Ethernet, and then the big uh, component for this project was the USB CDC. Okay. And so their existing system from a software perspective used free RTOS. Um, so they had two versions of the implementation. One is the final, which again was a simple, simple implementation where they just had a few peripherals that, were, that, that they had on their system. They had a, a blinky, basically just an LED that just demonstrated that the system was up and running. Uh, the USB CDC, which was the focus of this project, uh, a network interface. And then for the debugging uh, implementation, again, like I said, they not only had access to the RISC-V memory, but also registers uh, access to the other uh, hard blocks as well, USB, UART, et cetera. And of course, they had uh, a network interface to basically, so, so uh, essentially the, the way that you loaded, going back to here, the way you loaded, um, let's say, like in this case, we were targeting uh, risk, the risk five four, risk five core for the Zephyr implementation is you would, the, the host side would actually communicate over, over Ethernet to the ARM core, and then you would basically transfer the, the, the Zephyr binary to the ARM core, you would issue a command, and then the Zephyr binary would essentially uh, write uh, the, the Zephyr application into the risk five core. And so that's, that's why we needed uh, an Ethernet or network interface on the, uh, the, the free RTOS implementation on the ARM side. So what, and, and if you looked at, if, if you sat into um, Anas's talk, this, this keynote this morning, you know, kind of the, the, the problem with a lot of RTOS, especially free RTOS nowadays, is that it's not cohesive, unlike Zephyr, which you have a USB stack available for you. So they needed to actually incorporate a separate stack. They used Tiny USB for this. Um, it has USB host and device capability and it's targeted for embedded systems. So it's memory safe, there is no dynamic allocations. It's thread safe so that all the interrupts are deferred. Uh, if you, so essentially you would have to implement like some sort of task to go through and address the interrupts that have occurred. And it's cross-platform and, and open source. So this is kind of similar. So a lot of the USB stacks, uh, you know, this is similar to how Zephyr, like we saw in Johan's talk uh, on how it's implemented in Zephyr. Um, at the top, we have the application. So this is a custom implementation that we have. We have the underlying stack itself, which is essentially that middle region. And then on the bottom, we have the actual MCU port. So essentially, in their implementation, in their free RTOS implementation on the ARM itself, um, they just implemented the two ends. They had a task at the top, and then essentially they just implemented the interface to the Xilinx uh, hard block at the bottom. And that's it. That's all they really needed to do. So just really quickly, just looking at how TinyUSB implements uh, a lot of the abstractions for not only OS, but MCUs. Uh, basically, you just have to enable, um, and, and this is important because we'll see later on like what we ended up doing to get this work with Zephyr, which is a poor decision uh, on my part, but we'll get to that later. Um, so essentially, all you need to do is just set a macro to enable certain the, uh, some of the, the, the OSAL, uh, the, the OS abstraction that you want. So, you know, if you want to use free toss, you just free RTOS, you just specify the appropriate uh, macro, and then you have all of the essential uh, free RTOS primitives that you want to implement in, in tiny USB. Similarly, uh, so, so here we can see basically uh, this OSAL MS2 tick, and if we enable free RTOS, that's essentially what we have. We just have a really thin layer to the underlying um, R free RTOS implementation of like counting a tick essentially. And then we, they also have support for different MCUs. So, you know, we, again, leveraging a lot of the uh, underlying uh, microcontroller-based uh, uh, implementations of like leveraging some of like the synchronization primitives, you can, you can enable uh, using hardware-based primitives by specifying the appropriate MCU type that you want to use, right? And so for Xilinx, uh, initial, what they did is they just added another option for Xilinx in, in TinyUSB. And then all they did was just, okay, set that configuration option. They had a thin layer to implement some of the Xilinx primitives. And, you know, that was that. So basically, 
Uh, and the tiny USB implementation just added another directory for Xilinx, and th that's all that was really needed. And then from the other side at, at the application layer, just implementing the appropriate uh, tasking to address the, um, the, the device interrupts as well as some of the mechanisms for uh, the CDC implementation. So, right, so for not only did we have to enable it for Xilinx, but also just set it for free RTOS to set the config option for free RTOS, enable the CDC class, and then implement the, the relevant application code uh, to, to manage the CDC interface as well as the device inter interface. Um, so like I said, uh, just to summarize the application, what it ended up being is just like an echo application. Basically, you just have a task that's receiving data over the USB CDC and then just echoing it back, uh, transmitting back over USB. And then for the MCU port on the bottom side, uh, on the low level, you have the interrupt handlers and then uh, for initialization purposes, writing the appropriate registers in, on, in, in the controller itself uh, in response to tiny USB function calls. So the problem that they came to me was, hey, we wanna take this, we have a RISC-V core, we wanna, we wanna actually use the Zephyr stack now to work um, to, to basically do, uh, to, to interface with the Xilinx USB device controller and we wanna do the same thing that we have where we have a CDC controller and uh, we just wanna be able to echo uh, data and then ultimately not only just echo but we wanted to take measurements about in terms of performance. So later on there was like an iPerf application that was built to start exercising because we have to do, you know, for, for higher speed, for bigger packets, we need to do DMA instead of like asynchronous function calls. Um, so to use the DMA controller also in Xilinx and they wanted to be able to validate, well, how well is the DMA controller working? Is that all configured properly or are there some bottlenecks that we're not aware of? But this is going to focus more on the asynchronous, uh, just, you know, just sending a single character, really small USB packet, making sure that that's functional. So uh, again, that, that was the goal of the project. It's just, okay, we want to implement this now using Zephyr. So just a real quick, uh, before we dive into what, what, what we did, just a quick overview about how USB works. Um, so it all starts with when you plug in your device into, let's say your PC or your computer, right? The, the host side determines that, oh, like something is connected, right? There's, there's some device out there. So it starts interrogating the device. Um, it identifies essentially the type of device that it is and the services that the device provides. And then once it identifies, okay, what sort of device it is from a hardware perspective, what sort of services, quote unquote, uh, from a USB perspective that the device offers, it loads the appropriate host driver uh, on its end, right? So there are a couple of USB transfer modes. Um, there's a control, and we'll get into some of these later. There's the interrupt, there's a bulk, and then there's the isochronous. So uh, how, does, how, do those, how does that integration process occur? So that's essentially the basis of, of a USB transaction. There's a, a token packet, so there are numerous, a number of different packets that make up a USB transaction. There's the token packet, which essentially just has a header and it tells the device, okay, there's more stuff that's about to be that coming your way, so get ready to start processing it. Um, there's the data packet, which can be op optional, but it does contain the actual payload itself. And then finally, there's the, the status packet, either um, that's reported by the device or the host to tell it that, oh, that the, what you asked me to do was successful or you know, sometimes I'm not ready yet, can you come back to me later, which is essentially a knack, um, and then you know, let, uh, let, me process, let me continue to process that data and then come back to me later. Um, and then you can, there's also mechanisms in terms of a status packet for, for error correction. So you know, when, when I first got started with USB, this was a mindset that I needed to have, right, because everything starts with the host, right? Like, it's, it's a bit weird because when you're coming from other protocols, uh, like, it's, it's something to get used to and you have to basically form your mindset when you're looking at a lot of the, the USB traffic, like, understanding what's going on, you have to realize that, you know, US, the host controls everything. So there's nothing that the device can do unless the host actually requests it. Right, and so this is also reflected from the language as well, right? Some of the, the language that we see in USB, it's derived from this mentality that, oh, everything is from the host perspective. So, you know, just, just keep that in mind. So uh, just looking quickly at a USB packet, right? So there's some standard fields that exist in the USB packet. There's the sync, 
which is again, you know, in, in almost all communication schemes, right, there's something that exists, whether it's wired or wireless, right, there's something that exists to tell the other party that, hey, you know, this is, this, you know, a, a specific region in the packet, use this for synchronization or tell, I'm telling you like, this is a, I want to start communicating now. Um, there's the packet ID, which instructs uh, the side about what type of packet it is. There's the address, again, because USB is a bus protocol, you need to tell the device that, hey, uh, the host needs to tell the device that this is meant for you. Um, and then there's the endpoint, which we'll get into later. And then the token packet, uh, again, understanding the language, right, in means that the host wishes to read data from the device. So it's from the device to the host, and then the out, you know, that terminology and out token packet is essentially the host wants to write data to the device or send it or transmit data, right? It's all transmission, so transmit and receive is, is hard to kind of con conceptualize, but you know, I think understanding these, these specific terminology is helpful. And then finally setup uh, basically just is an instruction from the host to the device telling it that it wants to start an actual transaction. Um, and like I said, there's the final portion of, of any USB transaction is the handshake, so an ACK, is an, an indication that, oh, that the packet has been received, I'm working on it, right, and you know, everything is good to go. A knack is usually like, hey, um, you asked me to do something earlier, I'm still working on it, like you asked me for a, a response, right? The host is, when it, when it asks the device to do something, it wants to know is it done, or when, it's, when it wants to read information from the device, it says, oh, okay, you know, where's that information that I asked for you? ask from you and the device can sometimes say, you know, I'm still processing, you know, it took me some time, but, you know, just come back to me in a little bit. And then a stall is usually when something horribly has gone wrong, hey host, you need to step in and like, you know, do something to basically uh, correct what I'm doing. So kind of a quick graphic about what the general gist of a USB transaction looks like. So we have the token packet that comes in, the actual data packet, which can be uh, optional, um, or have a payload in it, and then finally we have the handshake packet that's, uh, that's, that contains the result of the actual transaction. So going into briefly about endpoints, um, so again, if you look at the arrow, it's um, essentially, you know, everything is initiated by the host, so the host is always asking for something or telling the device something. So let's say, you know, initially the device gets an interrupt that says from the host that says, oh, I have, a d have data on endpoint one out. So the device recognizes that interrupt, right? It goes to the appropriate buffer uh, that corresponds to that endpoint and for not only that endpoint but also that, that direction uh, for that endpoint. And then once it's done processing, it just dumps data into, let's say, the endpoint one in buffer, right? So now that data is sitting there. There's no mechanism for the device to let the host know that, oh, you can read now. It's whenever the host decides to read later, oh, you know, I want to see if data is now in endpoint one in, it's right there, right, for the host to retrieve. There's no mechanism for the device to let the host know that, yes, I'm done, here you go. Right, um, another important thing to keep in mind is that optional payload in the, in the data packet is, uh, corresponds to what's a, a zero length packet, right? So let's say um, the host sends out an out token to send data to the EP1 out buffer, as we saw in the previous slide, um, now the next time, so it, it wrote, you know, the host wants the device to do something. The host, to see if, that the, res if the device is ready or has parsed the, what, the instruction and has a result ready, the host sends an in token um, to check whether like, okay, did the device receive it okay, right? And it uses the zero length data packet because there is no information, right, that the host wants to sell the device. It says, hey, did you, is, did every, is everything okay? Did you get it? And then, uh, it, so it uses that zero length packet and then so if the device has successfully received the packet and is on its way to processing uh, that information, it just responds with an ACK. Uh, and then so like we, and we continue, the device processed the data in the endpoint one out. Um, so if, let's say, there was an error, um, the device didn't expect uh, the data in, in the packet, it just responds with an, it, with an ACK. Otherwise, if you know, everything looked okay in terms of processing that data, the device uh, just responds with an ACK. Um, similarly, let's say on the, on the other side, right, the, um, the, the host wants to know, okay, you know, enough time has passed by, or, you know, did, or do you have data for me to actually read? So it sends an in token to, uh, to read data from the EP1 in buffer, and 
So the um, and so with afterwards, it sends the out token to see if there's you know if if the device is ready for the next transaction. And again, it uses the zero length data packet to uh, see if the device is actually done and re ready for the next transaction. So you know just these zero length data packets that I, I learned during the course of this project was you know these are these are pretty important. There's there's some mechanism, there's some way to, by the host side, to enforce flow control uh, in USB, essentially. And so just some more kind of information about USB is that all devices must support endpoint zero. Um, and so it receives, a device receives all control and status requests uh, during enumeration using uh, endpoint zero. And it also, this endpoint allows the host to identify the functionality that's provided by the device uh, and to determine which other endpoints are available as well. So the enumeration process uh, from, from my experience with this project has been that the device descriptor request is one of the first things that happens. Um, and so you have the setup token, the data um, in that setup token is the device descriptor request, and then you have an, the, the next process, which is the host actually requesting, uh, determining which, which are the descriptors that the device actually sends, returns back with. And then the out token is really just, okay, are you ready? I have all the, the, uh, the descriptors of, of, the, of the endpoints and, and services that you support. Are you ready for the next transaction? So the initial approach, um, you know, leveraging, well, again, what Johan was talked about was we implemented this, the device callbacks, again, from the lower side and also uh, the using the low-level API and the high-level API. So, you know, just going about, I just started implementing some of these callbacks, and you know, um, from the from the host side, we use the we use Windows for just the CDC host driver, plugged in the device, right, and then we check Terra term to see if the character is being echoed. And before that, we essentially just use the Windows Device Manager to say, okay, does it show up as a COM port, right, and we use print case essential functionality like just to determine whether uh, all the callbacks and functions are being exercised, whether they're being called. Um, but we're not done, right? So of course, when we try this, as we all know, it fails the first time, right? We plug it in, right? And Windows just fails on the initial enumeration process. It doesn't know what, uh, which during the device descriptor request, it just fails immediately. So what do we do, right? There's so much further that we can get with troubleshooting using print case. Um, so we needed a way to independently track the USB transactions. So we used uh, this tool. Um, it's a pretty powerful tool. It can basically just plugs in line with your USB device and then you can essentially just store all the USB traffic that's going from the host to the device and see, okay, where are things going wrong? And so this is really just a capture of the traffic that's going back and forth with our device and uh, with, with, the, with the Windows host. And there's a lot of information here initially and so you, you, you tend to see a pattern. So um, what we ended up seeing was that, and do I get here? Yeah, and then the other, I'll, I'll talk into what we actually saw, saw with, those, uh, with, with those captures. And the other thing we actually ended up using was Xilinx's uh, internal logic analyzer. Um, and this was this is like a hardcore like FPGA diagnostic tool because the print case aren't helpful, the tool isn't helpful because you don't know exactly what's going on, like why the actual FPGA is responding the way it is. Um, and so what this tool allows you to do is is with really fine time precision see the actual signals in the FPGA to help you determine okay from the controller side like what's going on. Um, and the other thing that we use is also the ARM core, right? Like I said, the ARM core is actually hooked up to the, uh, U to the USB controller. So what we would do is we would actually, you know, this is really naive and barbaric way of doing debugging, but we would like have like infinite while loops at different stages of the USB initialization stack in Zephyr, and then just start poking like, okay, from the ARM side, okay, we have access to the USB controller register space, let's just see what it thinks should be happening. And so that was another mechanism that we used um, to troubleshoot like what's going on. And what we learned was through these kind of troubleshooting steps was we didn't actually set up the Xilinx controller properly. It was always sending out NACs. And so what would happen is the host would try, 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 try to do the initial device descriptor request. And because we didn't configure the controller properly, we would always be sending NACs out. And so eventually, right, the, the host has to give up eventually, can't 
uh, keep requesting forever. Um, and so we realized like, okay, uh, we actually didn't uh, configure the, the registers correctly. And like I said, we also used uh, the ARM core to basically peek and poke the controller registers to actually determine what the actual um, registers were. So what did we do, right? Fortunately, we were running out of time, right? This was like, uh, you know, we tried, couldn't figure out what was going on, like how to appropriately implement our driver. So we did, we, we, you know, we took a really hard pill, it was a really hard pill to swallow, and we just decided to port TinyUSB to Zephyr, right? We completely sidestepped the Zephyr stack. It's a pretty, I'm, I'm ashamed of this implementation. Like I really, I literally had a bag over my head for a couple of days. My daughter was asking me, you know, why am I so sad? And so we created, and it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, right? We created a new OS port for Zephyr, right? Again, we used essentially, that was why I kind of pointed out all these different layers for the different RTOSs. So we created an OSAL for Zephyr. We just implemented um, a lot of the primitives that TinyUSB uses for you know, tasking, for delaying, for getting ticks, um, just using the Zephyr primitives. And we, at the application level, we just created uh, two Zephyr th threads. One is to manage the actual device transaction, right? The controller from the FPGA side to set everything up. Okay, when interrupts are fired, to defer those interrupts and then, okay, come back around and start acting on those interrupts. And the other thread that we created was just a simple uh, application a thread to just echo uh, the CDC, right? So we have CDC data coming in and then transmit that back over to uh, on the Xilinx side and just write it to the register. And when we did that, we, it, it worked, right? So ultimately, uh, that implementation, we were able to get uh, a COM port to open Windows. Uh, we were able to echo back characters from our Xilinx implementation back to the, the Windows host, and everything seemed fine. But so we're done um, for now, yes. And so some of the next steps were, this was one of the first times that I got involved in Zephyr. Uh, so this was about a year, year and a half ago. Um, so I was naive at the time. It's like, oh, you know, the documentation says just implement this, right? Just imp implement these callbacks. I didn't, thinking back, I should have taken more opportunity. And I think I've grown in the past year where I've learned to actually dig through the code and actually get a sense of what's going on. And so, you know, at that time I was afraid. Um, so just some lesson like, you know, it's just code, right? It's not gonna bite you. You know, not, nothing's gonna blow up hopefully, right? It's just, it's just not gonna work, right? So going back, I probably would have, actually read more code to understand how the USB stack works and what the best way was uh, to actually incorporate the, the underlying Xilinx device driver into the USB stack. I mean, one of the other uh, requirements that they had was to have like a cake config and a device tree options and that, that worked, like I'm, I'm happy like I did that, right? Like I had a little, like when you ran the, the, the cake config GUI, like the Xilinx driver showed up, which was, which was nice. Um, but you know, happy customer, right? They actually just reached out to me before I hopped on a plane to come here and say, hey, are you free like mid-July to like work on another Zephyr project? I'm like, okay, great. So, you know, that's, it's not kind of the perfect solution, but in, in, in the commercial world, you learn at some point like, hey, whatever works and, and makes your client happy, like, you know, you gotta, you gotta do that in time. Uh, but, but I'm not done yet, right? So sure, client is happy but I'm not entirely happy, so there were two options, right? One is to port TinyUSB to Zephyr properly, right? I just implemented, just hacked in just the OSAL layer, but that's, that's pointless, right? Pointless, because we already have a pretty neat USB device stack, why not leverage it? So my, what my next step is to actually incorporate the Xilinx USB driver into the Zephyr stack and properly, right? And sure, I'm not gonna use the RISC V core because I don't have access to it, but I can just use the ARM core, right? Just create like a simple uh, implementation using the hard ARM core on a Zinc, um, and then just incorporate the, the, the device controller, and then just implement my driver the proper way, um, and just, you know, I have a Beagle tra uh, uh, analyzer, I can just use that to, again, go through the same verification process. And I don't have access to an in cluster, but I do have plenty of Zinc development boards, and so that's kind of like my next um, step. Any questions? Well, I'm gonna take like one last picture of everybody. Yeah, cool, thank you. <laughs>